German psychology department where I was an undergraduate uh, at Boston University, actually, uh, heard that I was reading poems, and uh, he called me in and gave me a dressing down because he's taking money under false pretenses. I just listened to him and calmly asked him, give me his poem, and I, we gave him a reading, and he said nothing, and I said nothing, I left. And two weeks later, I got a note from him saying, uh, would you please come see me? So I came. I should me into his office, he shut the door, he sat down, and he said, tell me more. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew it was pretty good. Uh, but I was uh, not a psych major at that time. But about that same time, I was, uh, and I was doing uh, one of my charity, uh, doing my uh, readings, there was a, a, uh, uh, one of the best mentors of all time, a man named Dr. Stanley Jacks, that's the way he called himself, and he was a good friend of mine. Whenever he came to come to the Boston area, you'd have to, if you could, you couldn't sit inside the booth, but you could sit outside the booth and through his curtain booth and listen to my readings, pardon me, then we got to discuss with me between clients. And one time he said to me, Ray, he said, as an interesting experiment, wouldn't it be just, what would happen if the next client came in and you read everything wrong backwards? And, you know, I admire this guy, he's a good friend of mine, so I, I went along with it. And I was giving this lady this reading when it, her hard line said that she was someone who doesn't like to show her emotion. I said, you show your emotion too much. <laughs> and the headline said that she's rational. I said, you're, you're a very irrational person, you're illogical, you're, you know, everything backwards. And she didn't move at all. And you get a lot of feedback when you give a reading. One thing I love about get a lot of feedback from people. When you tell them what they want to hear, their hands are moving very subtly towards you. Tell them things they don't want to hear and they're pulling back. And, and it's like they're actually shaping your meeting with their hands. It, it, it's, it's a wonderful uh, thing to do. You know, I think it's a, my cool reading technique is the best one. But anyway, uh, this lady was not reacting at all. No feedback. It's very spooky. It's like when you're talking on the phone to somebody and you don't hear anything from them. And she wasn't reacting. I said, Oh my God, I was thinking, I goofed, I made a terrible thing, I'm giving this lady a bad reading, and Stanley, I'm gonna give him a, you know, I'm gonna, when I get out finished, I'm gonna give him a piece of my mind. It turned out the reason she was not reacting, because she was absolutely in a state of shock how accurate I was. There was some, she was a lady, most of the people come, but people go about, I've been out hundreds of other readers as well, and she said, this is the most accurate, the best reading she's ever had in her whole life. And here I had done everything it's wrong. And I did the next, I tried the next few people and I realized that, by the way, I realized that whatever was going on here, it had nothing to do with the lines in her hand. And I switched my major at that time to psychology. That's when I became a psychologist. Yeah, great, great. I discovered, I got it, but I just, I just soon discovered, almost as soon as I got into psychology, I discovered that, uh, in fact, I had a course in, called Projective Techniques. They made me take it as the ink blot test and, and they even textbook they gave us had by Bell. Do you remember that book? You remember, I heard of it. It was a classic one time. And it had a chapter on graphology. And I could see right away, that, uh, and I went and did the literature search, and fortunately I already had good training in statistics. And I found that all the studies I could find that had been done on these projected techniques, the ones that were good, well done, then showed no validity to them. And yet, here, here there were teaching, they were crying everyone in the psychology department to take a year of projective techniques and the graduate students had a master of the ink blot test. And I said, they're worse, psychologists are worse than the people in the outside group. You know, at least there's uh, a palmistry, there's no evidence one way or the other, no one does research on palmistry. But at least there's evidence for the, uh, for psychological personality tests and it's all against it. <laughs> and so these people believing it and using it. So psychologists are, are more gullible than the general public. That was my finding when I went to psychology. And unfortunately, it's still kind of true, I guess. Not all psychologists, but uh, the ones who deal with personality seem to be that way. Okay, we've been doing the toolbox for 20 years now. Lindsay, you kind of grew up with this. Yeah, I, I started, um, my, I started coming to toolbox when I was about and um, are, are now ensconced sort of in the skeptical community, but you have all the 
these other experiences that also add to your abilities? Talk about things you've written and. Well, unlike these guys, I can't read anybody's mind. I'm a journalist, so if I want to know what people are thinking, I've got to ask them. And, and that's basically what I do. I'm a staff writer for Indies Times Magazine, and um, I do investigative journalism. I write about uh, medical, pharmaceutical, you know, health-related health -related topics. And um, I also uh, work for the Sydney Hillman Foundation, which is a nonprofit that honors excellence in socially conscious journalism. I'm a, I run their monthly awards program, so I'm the judge and coordinator for that, so I spend a lot of time thinking about the media and its influence on, on skepticism and scientific literacy and that kind of stuff, and what makes for good and bad media, that what enhances or undermines our understanding of the world around us. Yeah, the advantage of being your father's daughter, um, talk about how, uh, did, he, did he turn you on to skepticism? How did that yeah, happen? very much. I mean, it's sort of funny, the skeptics movement is now finally old enough that we're like Scientology, we have second gen. But, uh, you know, I was always really involved with, um, my dad started the BC Skeptics organization, so I'd go to the meetings, I forget what year the BC Skeptics was started, but I started going to the meetings when I was really little, and uh, working on the newsletter with four hundred as a family, we'd have uh, newsletter stuffing night, so we'd go and, you know, get drink, you know, drink soda, which we weren't usually allowed to have, and eat pizza and stuff newsletters for the skeptic, from the Russian and the wire, and um, it was the name of the BC Skeptics newsletter, and uh, my dad would do a lot of media interviews, so, you know, instead of hiring a babysitter, I'd just come with him to wherever he was getting interviewed, so he'd go be on the radio, or sometimes he'd be on TV, sometimes we'd have to get lots of skeptics together to go to a TV broadcast, it'd be, you know, Gloria and Lapierre's Beyond the Line, Out of Body Experiences, or something like that, or this satanic music caused suicide, or, you know, there's always something new and different. So, and uh, so I'm Can I interrupt this? Yeah, sure. Uh, when I first uh, met Lindsay, she was about eight or even younger, and uh, I would go up, uh, Barry, her father, would have me come up, have me come up there to uh, have a safe at home, of course, and uh, I would give talks for the Bridget B.C. Skeptics, which her father founded, and also at Simon Fraser University, which where he taught, and, uh, and she was always in the audience, she was always in the front row, sitting in the front row, six-year-old, and the very first question get right after my talk was from Lindsay, <laughs> a tough question. <laughs> she was right there, she, she was better than any adult, so on. And I, this was a little adult in, in a way, but then we'd go back to her home uh, for dinner or something like that, and there were other kids there. She would play with the kids like, they, like she was a kid, but then she'd come back and discuss things with adults as if she was a full adult. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, may, I almost wonder how, I mean, what did your friends think about this, or how were you to them about these issues? I think kids are just kind of pretty accepting. I mean, they sort of knew that I was into this sort of thing. And I mean, I guess it got a little bit harder to be a teenager when people are into Ouija boards and whatever. But um, so, you know, maybe a little bit more weirded out by the whole skeptics thing. But, uh, you know, the, the kids that I've known from way back, you know, some of them were, you know, had parents and skeptics too, so we had kind of a little community. You think you brought a few of them along as I you were? I hope so. Yeah. I really hope so. And Jim, you were here almost since the beginning. You've done almost all the toolboxes. Uh, when well, did you start? I'm not sure what year I started, but uh, Ray and I and a magician, my name is Steve Shaw, now Manichek, gave, I think, very, the, the very first... That was the very first work for Shaw in, in Buffalo. Right. And, yes. and so then Ray had begun this, uh, this group. And uh, shortly after, I'm not sure which year it was, he, he asked me if I could come out and get involved. So. Well, we were able to finally get him here. Uh, the problem is always finance and financing. You know, we always have a small uh, tendency, which is good, because being small makes it much more of a learning experience and better. But on the other hand, financially, it makes it difficult, because uh, we don't actually lose money most of the time financially, as I understand it. <laughs> uh, uh, but, um, but, uh, so I always wanted to get Jim out here, and finally, um, I think it was uh, a while since we lost uh, some of the people. You know, we, we, we had some turnover. But I finally convinced uh, Barry, to, okay, you can, you can get Jim, finally. And so it, it took a long while, but, uh, but I finally got him. And Harriet Hall's here now? No, Harriet was, uh, was the replacement for, she was actually one of our, people who come here. In fact, she 
credits this, her experiences here as giving her the courage to go and begin doing what she's doing. So we, we like to take the credit for her. She gives us the credit, so not, we'll accept it. <laughs> uh, she, was a, she used to come here, but she became a disciple of, because uh, she's an MD, you know. Uh, and uh, she uh, became sort of a disciple of, of Wally Sampson's and began writing for his journal.